have to. Yeah, so accept this. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, let me also share this because if the line goes down, so Corrado, okay, I made co-host. So it's a great pleasure uh, uh, to have Lorenzo Giambaldi. So thank you so much also for this uh, great mini course and to explain this very complicated, uh, um, you know, framework in, in some very rational and intuitive also way that, you know, of course the details maybe we have to look after, but you make clear very general pictures. So thank you so much. So we are looking forward for the, unfortunately the last lecture, but uh, I'm sure that Lorenzo will, will come to Lorenzo for some other practical problem that we are, we are dealing with. <laughs> so thank you, Lorenzo, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad that you appreciate at least the, the, the coherence of the whole picture. I also, I mean, I, I, I try to do my best because during, during my, my studies, uh, it was pretty, pretty tough to, 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 to have like a full picture of deep learning because very often there are courses of machine learning and they also uh, talk about deep learning and somehow a lot of techniques that you use on, on in uh, in deep learning are very very specific and so it's easy to 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 be confused because of the fact that there are i mean the the, the topic is huge and literally like it's 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 very 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 tough also to 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 find a proper textbook i i i i uh, I, will, I have sent you some of the um, the main reference, which to me are a great ground base, which you can from which you can start in a, in order to 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 learn how deep learning works. And uh, actually, I, I I would like to stress that uh, uh, as you will find, that there are one or two of them which are YouTube videos. And uh, to me, it's really I mean, the, I, I want definitely. The, it's the uh, it's kind of uh, uh, a double-edged sword in this sense. The fact that uh, deep learning is a topic which is super, now spreading very fast, and there are lots of people working on it. Sometimes you can find bad materials, but sometimes you can also find very very nice material, also from people who are somehow uh, not very expert of, of of the field, so not deeply deep, like super hyper expert of the field. So without following, for example, uh, lessons in university, but you can, but, but maybe uh, they, they can still be very clear. And, and to me, it was like super, super relevant in my in my learning experience to have different perspective, because as, as you might have seen, it's sometimes the theory is very tough in the, from a statistical in the sense that it's quite abstract. But then what you do is kind of very simple. And so you, it, it's very often it's tough to map simple concept to very difficult theory. <laughs> so uh, today we will basically conclude all the, 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 the flow in the sense that I will tell you about, uh, uh, finally, I will write down how basically a learning algorithm is structured. So how what you will do if you sit, your, uh, if you sit in front of a computer and you say, okay, let, let, let me deal with the data that I have. And then I will discuss a little bit on uh, the concept of regularization, because it's a concept that we have introduced in our uh, lesson, uh, some kind, kind in a shady way, but actually it's a, it's a very useful concept and it's quite linked to one of the few, um, uh, let's say, gl glimpses of <laughs> I, I would, uh, one of the few things I will try to, to, to tell you about of my ongoing research, which is basically on uh, how you can somehow simplify the um, the function and aka the network that you obtain at the end of the learning pro process so that you can expect it and analyze it. Because as you might have understood, as soon as you end a deep learning uh, algorithm and the more, the, I mean, the more the time is passing, the more this is true, you end up with a very, very deeply complicated function which very often is uh, very, it's hard to, to, to understand and hard to inspect. So let, let's start with the, with the learning algorithm. What the, the idea is that uh, as always, we would like something that is a function of data of the um, hypothesis, uh, of the uh, hypothesis space and of, let's say, yeah, the, the cost function or the loss function L. 
Okay. So let's imagine that you start with a data set D. What you do? So you, you are given a set of data. Those sets of data in our framework comes as a tuple, which is constituted by X, the input, and Y, the output. So you know what the output should be. This is the framework that is called, if you remember, supervised learning framework. Now, as soon as you have these sets of data, you start with a very simple thing. You start dividing them into two sets, one which is the trained set and another one which is the validation set. Now, this is something that it's, um, that it's the form, I mean, very often, the, this, uh, the, 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 the data will come in different in different forms. Okay, maybe it's better if I start it in this way. Very often, that data will come as a raw data plus a test set. This is a, usually a good data set is given you in this form with data and the test set. So for me, the, 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 this is a crucial difference that I have already uh, somehow tried to convey you because the test set is something you completely forget at the very beginning of the thing, you, you, you just put it, put, put it aside. Okay, so let's assume that we start with the data set and the, and the test set. And, let's and what we will do is basically divide the data set into the train and the validation set. So now I have basically two different things, the train set and the validation set I can work on. How can, how can, I, can, I, can I use this? Well, I have to fix the hypothesis space. So let's fix the hypothesis space H, which means that I have some kind of mapping between R to the power of, let's say, M to the space of functions. So this mapping is done by a parameterization of the space of function. And very often, this is something that, I mean, very often, if you are doing deep learning, it's very likely that you that this mapping will be from the parameter space of the wings of, of the of the links and biases to the functional space of the neural network of a given size, so of a given dimension, so of a given number of layers. This basically accounts for every prior knowledge you want to put inside your network somehow. So you would like to, if if you have the feeling that the function will have to be very complicated. This, for example, you want to regress a function that is a uh, that somehow uh, aims at learning different level of abstraction in your data set. You might go for a very deep network, so you will fix the number of neurons per layer and the number of hidden layers. Of course, the input space and the output space, as we have seen the last time, are fixed by your problem. Okay, so. As soon as you have that, you have a parameter space. And the, you, you have a, sorry, uh, an hypothesis space, which accounts for having a set of parameters that, you, that, that we will indicate, that we have, um, uh, we, we have uh, indicated as theta, okay? So now you have to fix also two very, um, two very important variables, that two very important hyperparameters, which are the number of epochs, T, and the batch size, which is equivalent to fixing the number of batch, if you remember from the last lesson. What does it mean? The number of epochs somehow is a, uh, something that concerns how long you would like to train your neural network. So how, um, how many updates you will do, it's very deeply connected to the number of updates that you will do during the, the, during the stochastic gradient descent that I've introduced you, into, that I've introduced you last lesson to the parameter space. And that is also dependent on the batch size that if you remember is something that we have introduced in order to somehow add some kind of uh, noise inside the learning, which, which helps us um, solving some kind of problem connected to the fact that this gradient, that the gradient with respect to the parameters is something that it, it's not monotonous. It, it's, it's not constant. It, it's not something that, that, yeah, it's not monotonous. And basically, the, this also means that the function is not convex. So the loss function is not convex with respect to the parameters that we have used in the neural network. 
another thing that you might say that you basically each of these batch, uh, which is something that if you remember, uh, I, I will also write it now, uh, but if you remember the idea was that you basically kind of estimate at each batch during, using each batch. So using each uh, sub portion of your data set, you would like to estimate the proper gradient. And so you concatenate several estimates of the proper gradient. But the idea is that those two things have to be fixed at the very beginning of your, of your learning algorithm. And so now that you have done this, what you have done is basically fix the hyperparameter space. This is another thing that you might have uh, that you that you might have heard of. Whatever you learn, whatever you hear about hyperparameter optimization, very often is this uh, means something that is a practice that you um, that you do in order to find the best number of epochs and the best patch size and the best hypothesis space, like the best shape of your neural network. But those three, now the learning process is not yet um, started, hasn't, hasn't started, okay? So those things need, need to be fixed at the very beginning. Once we have, the, once we have them, if we, Agree that you that you want to do the uh, as a um, optimization the the uh, stochastic mini batch. So what I already uh, mentioned as a, a stochastic gradient descent with batch with, with mini batch, the algorithm will goes as follows. So those are fixed. Let me erase that erase that so that let me get there so that one mess up the notation. But remember. Yeah, okay. Now for P that is in zero dot the total number of epochs. So for each epoch, for each epoch, what you do? For now we introduce another index. I think I called it J which is the index that runs on the batches. So on each subdivision of our data set, if you remember. We will update our parameters. So theta at step nb times t plus j plus 1 it will be equal to theta at step and b times t plus j. So the older step, so it will be the same, minus a, a, a parameter alpha, which we will we have just introduced as a, as a um, learning rate. For our purposes now, the learning rate is something we, 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 we will not fix. Usually it's given in, in your algorithm. It's not the degree of freedom in the hyperparameter space in the hyperparameters domain, but let's now just focus on what I, what I mentioned. We will do the average of the gradient of the loss function with respect to the parameters of the function f, which will be a neural network of x and theta, y. And this average is something that will be done on the batch J. So what we are doing, uh, É, acho que vai precisar pedir para... Olá? É. Você, Oi, você... Stefania, tudo bem? Acho que congelou, caiu. É, ele está com problema na conexão. Ah, tá. É... Então, vou, vou, vou... Depois você... Ok. Oh, let me accept it. Yeah. So, uh, for each batch, which remember where the disjoint subdivision of our data set 
or in this case of our train set, bj in number nb for, so for each of them what I do I update my parameters uh, Hi Lorenzo so Do I update my Lorenzo. parameters sent during this uh, mini batch stochastic gradient Yeah? Yeah, yeah your connection today uh, is not great uh, it's very choppy. Uh, oh, do okay. you have a, do you have an, an alternative network? Uh, mm, I think so. Let, 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 let me try one. Okay. Uh, let me try to do this. I don't know why it's happening. So. Okay. So. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, now it's perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I will do basically, I will update my parameters using this rule, which is the rule I basically already uh, told you last time. So at each step, then I have a set of parameters theta, my links and my biases. And what I will, what, what I'll do is change them at the next step with, by, by an amount. That is the Gaussian descent with respect to the theta parameters of my loss function averaged on my batch bj. This is something. So this is an operation that we 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 made to be to, and uh, we, this introduce you two 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 things. The first thing that this thing introduced is somehow some kind of stochasticity because the batch size are usually generated at each after i mean uh, uh, generated at random and so what 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 it's very important to understand is that the evaluation of the of the function f is on random point on the on the of the train set and at each step and then you average these so somehow another thing that you are doing is basically estimate the proper gradient in kind of an online fashion, in the sense that you are progressively estimating the proper gradient of the loss function, but using subsamples of your data set, of your train set. So using this, we will be pretty sure somehow, I mean, if everything goes right, we, we will be somehow sure that our loss will be more or less on average decreasing. Okay. Now, another in the thing that we have we have to introduce is basically the validation set and this is something that we have already introduced like that last uh, uh, last lecture and the idea is that we have to evaluate so after we, the, the step we will evaluate the lv the loss on the validation set which is one over the dimension of the validation of the sum over x, y that are inside the validation set, which be, be careful, is not something that I'm using here, of the last function of f and n, x, theta, y. So now I evaluate this lv, so the loss on the validation. And I do, I do one thing. So if LB is increasing, then I will stop. Otherwise, I will continue. That's basically the the bit the, like the the core of the learning in the sense that what are we doing we are computing somehow we, we are doing stochastic mini batch gradient descent on our loss function which means that we would like to minimize our loss function on our train set this is something that we do by an adjustment of links and biases in our network this adjustment will be somehow um, 
at random in the sense that it, this is if you run this several times uh, you you will not get exactly the same function if you start from the same initialization so from the same set of parameter you have decided at the very beginning but after each update we will evaluating of course the loss function on the train set but also the loss function on the validation set this means that th this thing here is something I will track in order to uh, be aware of the problem that neural networks very often have, or which is the overfitting. So what I will try to do is basically stop as soon as my estimate of somehow the test loss so of the the out of sample loss of the loss that i will be that, that i will do on the whole distribution is getting worse so that's the idea behind this algorithm here this technique here which is called early stopping technique and it's a very popular and very effective technique if you have somehow if, if for you is not as much of a deal to divide your data set into two things like that okay so after that when i stop so assume that after a while maybe after 12 epochs if t is uh, i don't know 50 after 12 epochs my validation loss is start increasing so i will stop and then this set of parameters will be so when i stop i will have that my learning algorithm A of D, H, and L will have outputted me an F and N of theta star. So that's what my estimate of the best set of links and of biases in my, uh, of, yeah, of biases in my network. Now that I have this function, we need to understand how this function is performing. And this is something a little bit different from the evaluation strategy. Why? This is a very delicate point, so try, try to be to to be uh, focused because it's a very very it's a common mistake in the, in the in the field. Wherever I use some data in my learning algorithm, those data are something that cannot be in the test set because more or less in one way or another i have done some kind of gradient descent on those data the the idea is that my s I, I would like to have a proper estimate of the error that my loss that, that my function is doing on the whole distribution of data not only on my distribution of data but on the whole distribution of data the one that i will uh, i mean that, that i haven't seen yet and in order to do this, this I need to, to have some kind of fresh, unused data. So those two things are somehow inside your data set. This is the train set and this is the validation. But then there is the test set, which are data I haven't used neither for my optimization nor for my learning stopping, stop, stop not, nor for my early stop algorithm. So my early stop criteria, sorry. So once that I have this, I will evaluate one my uh, test loss LT, which is one over the dimension of T of my loss function of N. Sorry, let me do this. LT, which is one over the dimension of the test set of the sum over OX, Y that belongs to the test set of my loss function L of F and N X theta star. So the set of parameters that I have after my learning algorithm, Y. And this is what I declare. I declare this number so if you want to do things properly this is the quantity you should care now after that it's over from a moral point of view 
your learning algorithm, it's over. In the sense that if you would like now to do again the whole process, morally, it's not the right thing to do. Why? Because let's assume that your LT is a bad number. It's much worse than your LV. So let's assume that your LT is higher than your LB, so the loss on validation. This means that, I mean, what you are trying to, maybe what you will start to think is that, well, actually, I'm kind of overfitting a lot and I, my whole process is not, a, is not very well tuned. So maybe the, my early stopping criterion, so the parameters that the early stop criteria depends on, which are a set of parameters I'm not discussing here, but if you are interested, you can somehow tune a little bit how you define the increase on the validation loss. Maybe those are wrong ones. Maybe my whole process is, I mean, I've started from a wrong point. I don't know. There, are, there might be several, several reasons that made my test loss much higher than my validation loss. And of course, much higher than my but they, that my loss on the data, on the train set. Now, if this happens and you run this again, maybe you can tell, and I think that it, it, it's kind of straightforward to, to say that now in this, in this new process, morally, there is no difference between the test loss and the, the, the test and the validation set. Why? Because you have used your test set to make a decision that has an impact on theta star. So this is like a mantra you should always <laughs> try to, um, to, 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 to shun in your head. And there's, the thing is that the, the train set is, is uh, sorry, the test set is something that you will only use at the end. And as soon as you've used your test set, you're done. That, that, that's the idea, okay? And this is the performance you should look for in every article. There is a lot of misconception, a lot of confusion. Um, I, 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 maybe now people are becoming a little bit more aware, like with, with respect to, I would say, when I started my, my PhD, in the sense that, so two, two, two years ago, people are becoming a little bit more aware, but believe me, there is a high chance for you to read a performance that it's not the test loss. And you, the meaning, that, this, that, that, that the performance has, if it's not the performance on the test loss is zero, absolute zero. So if you want to under, if someone says, oh, I have this very incredible uh, method that you can use in order to predict the evolution of the, sp uh, of the spreading of a disease in a network, it's a graph neural network. It takes as an input your graph and your initial state. And I've trained this model on billions of, of, of epidemics. And this is my performance. So this is how, how well I can uh, predict the behavior of the, of the pandemics. And it, the, the, this number is how much he does, so is the loss function on the train set, then you should say, I have gained zero information from this, zero information. Why? Because you would like to know the test loss. Okay, so very, very important thing. Now, always look for that in, in papers because sometimes it, it's very shady. And if it's very shady, it means that, I mean, the thing is that, why, why this is a big problem in deep learning? Why? This is a very important thing. This is such a big problem in deep learning because remember, neural networks are universal approximators. And moreover, neural networks and these kind of, 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 of learning techniques are very powerful, which means that no matter what, with a, the with a proper effort, and it's not even that much of an effort actually, you can always achieve basically zero loss on your train set. So you can always minimize this. Why? Because your function space has the capability to approximate the function that passes, that, that is exactly the value you want in every element of the data set. So with a, with a very graphical picture, if you have this data set, your hypothesis space for sure. So this is a Y and this is X. This function here will very likely be part of your hypothesis space. 
And this is something that is very, very, um, I mean, finding this function is something that you, uh, you would like to avoid because what you want is the performance on other data and very likely those other data will be different from your trained data. And so this function here will generalize very poorly, as we say in this in this field. Okay. So sorry, sorry, sorry to, yeah? to interrupt, but like could yeah, you yeah. like just review the difference between the notion of um, test and validation sets, because it's not really that clear to me yet. Because I mean uh, the, the, if if for example I wanted to the the the, the gist of it. Mm -hmm. issue, the, the, the whole the, the the main point would be to try to minimize the loss on the test set, right? But uh, I mean, apparently, yeah, yeah. The, as you've written uh, down there, the validation mm -hmm. loss is always uh, le less than the, the test loss. So I mean, yeah. wouldn't it be like more interesting to also to instead of just focus on the validation loss instead and try to minimize it instead, or is it like harder to do or something? Oh yeah, well the the thing is that. Uh... The problem always comes in the form of data. You have data and you would like to exploit those data as best as you can. So one, one way in which you can do, there are several strategies, but to me, the most didactic one is, is, is the following. You would like to use your data, which, which comes as a data set and as a test set in, in, my, in my view. So, Data set is a set of, again, X and Y, and you have another set of X and Y. If you download the, the, the data set that is called MNIST, which is like a very, very simple data set, very popular, uh, or even C510 or uh, a lot, lot of other data set, usually they come in this form. They, have, they are the data set and the test set. So the train set somehow and the test set. So the test set is always clearly visible and different from all the rest. So when you... Uh, the test set is something that it's something that you can you, you should use in order to have the proper estimate of the out of sample error. So the, the proper estimate of how your algorithm performs on data that you have not used to optimize it. I, I believe, and like for, that's so the definition of the test set somehow. And mm -hmm. if you if you if you um, if you look carefully, you have done some kind of optimization in your validation set this, so the yes. validation okay why which is the, the, the optimization that you've done you have basically optimized with respect to the epochs yes Be mm -hmm. because you're saying as soon as the, the validation loss is increasing then stop so the best epoch mm -hmm. so the best uh, number of total epochs is the one that you have found using the validation so it's very shady, but inside mm -hmm. the validation, you have done some kind of gradient descent. And this gradient descent is done with respect to the epochs, which are an yeah. hyperparameter. So usually you are using the validation to do this hyperparameter optimization, and you are using the train set in order to do this parameters optimization. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you are changing hyperparameters, Formally, you are also changing your learning algorithm parameters. And so mm -hmm. your estimate in the end, it's basically something that is a function of the operation that you've done on your train and on your validation. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something that is very correlated to the data that you have used in your validation and in your train set. Now mm -hmm. you want a proper estimate, which is not correlated to that. And so you use the test set. Okay, and so the test so, is going to mimic like real world data pretty much. Exactly, the text is precisely the test set are real world data. And real world data, of course, I mean, if you want to evaluate the performance of your learning algorithm, you should evaluate the performance on real world data, not on data that I have already seen, right? Yeah. Well, which would be so, the, the validation data. Which much. will be yes. the validation. So this is an example. Usually, if you look for an early, a learning algorithm, the, there is no, no distinction between validation. And the, usually, the, they, the, there is the trained set and the test set. But to yeah. me, it's very important to know the difference as soon as possible between this idea of exploiting data to minimize some kind of parameters. Because in real world practice, what you will do is using a validation set. And so it, 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 the validation set is a concept that is very, very important because if you've understood the problem in this framework here, then you are aware of what does the test performance mean. 
And very often, believe me, unfortunately, also in, in, in papers which are on medicine or on like very, very relevant somehow uh, societal uh, topics, they give you the performance on the validation uh -huh. or the performance on the train set. But you have to be aware that there are two types of data, data that you use for the, mini the learning algorithm. So that you, that you use in order to produce the theta star set of parameters and data that you use that you that you don't use to do that. Mm -hmm. so to test your the theta star, like, to test how, how good your theta star is. Pretty much. Exactly, how, to yeah. test how good your the, the star parameter is. Yeah. That's, the, the, mm -hmm. the, that's precisely the idea. So real world data are something that are basically away from your process. Every time that you are used some kind of data in your learning algorithm, those has to be different from the one in the test set. So this validation train set, this train validation example is to be a very didactic example that starts you to somehow uh, uh, get to getting, that may, maybe gets you a little bit more familiar with the fact that sometimes data can be used in a very shady way in your learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. But be aware that in this, as soon as you use them, you are doing some kind of gradient descent. In this case, with the early stopping technique, the learning set descent, sorry, the, the gradient descent is something that you are doing with respect to the epochs. There are also some kind of algorithms. We do the same trick, more or less, but maybe with the size of the network, maybe with the learning rate, the, the alpha parameter, maybe with the batch size. But every time that you use something separate to, uh, to, to do some kind of gradient descent on the hyperparameter space, this is very likely to be a validation set usage. And so be aware of the difference between the validation and the test. OK? All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. No problem. So and yeah, usually this is something that it's, I mean, it's always a problem. But with neural network, is that much of a problem because <laughs> of the fact that they are really universal approximators. So you are very likely to do whatever you like with your data. That, that, that's the thing. If I have enough time and enough computational power, I can always achieve zero validation loss or two. And so this, this is a problem. But with, with zero validation loss, it's very unlikely that I will do zero test loss. So now that we have this, this is the so-called early stopping technique. There is actually a very nice interpretation of the early stopping technique. I unfortunately have no time to, 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 to go deeper into that. But the thing is that more or less you can have the same um, result. So you can somehow avoid overfitting by not employing the early stopping technique. So let's say not employing somehow a validation a, te a test a train validation split, but using the uh, regularization technique, which is called weight decay or L2 norm uh, decay uh, technique. And it's a very popular one. And this is another way in which you can somehow avoid the, the overfitting problem. So remember that neural networks are in this case, hypothesis space very large. So very likely the test loss is here. The, sorry, the, the target function is inside your hypothesis space, but also you have a very, very high variance. So in order to avoid this, the, this regime here, so in order to, to compensate for this high variance, you can use either the early stopping technique, which is the one I mentioned you, but you can also somehow do the same, have the same effect, more or less. I mean, in very simplified scenario, you can actually analytically prove this. And there is a very nice analytical proof in the book, uh, uh, Deep Learning by good fellow Benjo Corbell that I, that I, that I, 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 uh, I wrote to you. And uh, um, the idea is that you get exactly, more or less the same effect if you are not minimizing just the, the train loss function, but also another thing. So now we will introduce the concept of regularization loss. And the regularization loss is basically every kind of uh, addition that you do to your loss function in order to minimize 
theoretically the generalization error, so the test error and not the training error. So you are adding, you are making your uh, optimization problem somehow harder or different in order to have a function that is less likely to overfit. So how do you do this? Usually the loss function is not just one over the size of the train set times sum over x, y that belongs to the train set of L of f of x theta y is not just that, but you add a term that it's a function of only the parameters. Now, which is the form of this term? A very common form of this term is when omega omega is the sum over all so over the size of my parameter space of theta i square so what you are doing here is that you also want to minimize the l2 norm square of your parameters of your connections or and or your and or your biases so the idea is that you don't want just minimize so you then you will when you will compute the gradient uh, the, uh, with respect to theta of the loss function you will have the proper train loss function but you will also have the regularization and so this is usually called regularization uh, regularization loss so my loss function or my cost function will be the sum of the proper loss plus something that is here in order to find a good function also in terms of generalization property so this is a way so employing this is more or less equivalent to doing the early stop. So in your head, it could be seen as as a thing as the, as having the same effect. Here, I will not work at the level of hyperparameter space. So here, I, I work in terms of optimize the epochs. Here, I'm adding. constraints okay so those practice here are very popular especially in neural networks why because you have this very very high likelihood of overfitting so of finding a function that does basically zero on your train set and is doing something that is much worse on your uh, in terms of loss on your uh, test set now with this thing what you are doing is somehow promoting only very few uh, very few uh, connections in your in your um, in, in your network and the idea is that using this what you will end with something that is more or less sparse in terms of network this is something you can also achieve and now there are several types of regularization loss. A very popular one is the L2. This one is called L2. There is also the L1, let me mention this, yes, which is the sum over i over all the space of the absolute value. The effect of this is, of course, to promote sparse solution. And what this is the idea is that here, what you want to do is you want to bound your, your search on, on small parameters. And so hopefully you will not find very weird solution so adding this constraint helps you hopefully to generalize well better not well. okay so those two things affect the way you will explore your parameter space because this is because if you add something like that if this is the shape of, if your loss function is like that, 
Then adding this will of course change the shape of your loss function in, in, in a way that usually it's not predictable or I mean, it's somehow something you can try to tackle as a problem, but the idea is that you are changing this towards solutions that generalize better. That's the idea of adding these regularization laws. Usually the generalization loss is something that happens on parameters that you have used in your network. So on parameters like uh, um, on, on parameters like the, the, the weights or the biases or other things, our idea, I mean, in, in my research, we have tried to change the way you parameterize your neural network. And if you change the way you parameterize your neural network, then the way you will explore solution changes, especially if you have a regularization loss too. So which is the way that we, are, we have proposed? The idea is that if you want to promote a, a nice network somehow. So if you want to, to have a, a proper neural network after the optimization, you would like to look for a simple solution. But simplicity is something that is all, that very often I and mean, hopefully comes also with higher interpretability. So the idea is that you can somehow change the way you parameterize your function and doing a regularization technique in order to promote simple network that hopefully are not as difficult to analyze as the one that you would have if you use the conventional strategy. I will try to be uh, as clear as possible, but the idea is the following. Let's assume that you have a neuron, okay? And usually what you do is that you have X and you multiply by W, and you, this is W1, this is W2, this is W3, and then you get the activation, remember? So the activation will be sigma of this whole of, um, of weights multiplied by each input component. So this is what you will get, W times X. So it is the scalar product, plus B. So for the moment, let's ignore B because it's something that you can always reabsorb in terms of W. And so if you have several activations, this is the parameterization that I propose you. So this is something we have already seen. This is something that is basically a multiplication of a vector X of size and K. This will be and k, and you will get something that is of size and k plus one. What I propose you is add a parameter in this process, or add in this case n k parameters that works as follows. Instead of having just this vector matrix multiplication, I will add here a vector of size n k plus one. And then we also do the Adamar product. The Adamar product is the, ele is the element wise product in the sense that what happens here is that I'm multiplying by a, a single scalar each row of, of my matrix. So if this is the set of parameters lambda, and this is the set of parameters W, my transfer of information will not be simply W times uh, Wx. So my linear activation A at layer k plus one i, usually it's sum over j of w i j x j. Now I will add lambda i. So this lambda i is just another parameter that I've added. What is the idea behind this parameter here? The idea behind this parameter here is that you will also like uh, you will also want something that leverages that weights each feature that you have extracted in total. So AI will be something that is the matrix. This is the matrix multiplication, and this is the Hadamard product. 
more or less, no, more or less. Yeah, that, that, that's how it is, okay? So what's happening now? You start with lambda equal to one. And if lambda are i are equal to one in this transfer, what you have are the conventional transfer of information. So when you will compute the gradient with respect to w, you will explore the space as if the neural network is like usually parameterized. Okay, it's, it's, it's parameterized as usual, okay? But what if after starting at this, I also compute the gradient with respect to lambda? So I compute the gradient with respect to w and lambda. Then after the process, after the learning process, I can inspect each lambda because I'm computing the gradient with respect to w and lambda. So I'm computing the gradient with respect to each connection, which are the elements here in your matrix of w, and with the total weight, so with the total impact that the, the set of connections or this feature has on the loss function, because this is what the, the gradient with respect to lambda is doing. So the idea is that I would like to introduce in my network a number, a scalar, which, we, which is one for each node that leverages, that, that, that is, is capable of telling me how relevant has the feature that this node is extracting been in the learning process. So if this lambda is equal to zero, if lambda i is equal to zero, so let's assume that this lambda here is equal to zero, then it means that this whole thing here will be multiplied by zero. So this feature here is not relevant. And remember that the features are nothing but bundles of connections. So the features in a feedforward fully connected neural network are something like that. This is a feature. This is another feature. So this whole set of connection. This is another one, and so on and so forth. So if I find at the end that this lambda here at the end of training is equal to zero, so the norm of this parameter is equal to zero, my assumption is that this node is not relevant. And so when I, after, after the, the learning process, I now have a set of parameters, which are my lambda here, that are somehow how much this feature is relevant. And so the concept of simplicity is something you can transfer by saying that you would like to, those lambdas to be as small as possible. And so, if you parameterize in this way, so by adding to each linear transfer of information an Adamar product by a set of parameters that I call lambda, and you do this for every layer, then the loss function I would, I would optimize is basically the loss equal to the loss on the data set plus an L2 norm of Ws plus an L2 norm of lambdas. Using this clever, this clever, this parameterization, what you can impose is use as less feature as possible. That's the idea of this parameterization. And then in the end, you can do a pruning technique. So you can actually a network compression technique or a network slimming technique, as it's called, that is based on the magnitude of those parameters. So if those parameters are small, you can then remove them. And what actually we are finding is that using some kind of controlled scenario, and the controlled scenario are all in the framework where you learning, the, uh, where, where you know the, the, the learning function, the, the function to learn. Actually, the complexity of the network that you get using this technique is basically the same as the complexity of the network of, of, of the learning function. So, of the, sorry, of the function that you want to learn. Let me tell you this way of testing that. So let me go dive a little bit deeper, dive a little bit deeper on that, because it's a very useful theory, theoretical framework. And the theoretical framework is actually very easy in our formalism. And the theoretical framework is called the teacher-student framework.
And what I'll do is basically tell you the impact that this thing has on the teacher-student framework. Which is the teacher-student framework? The teacher-student framework is very easy. Remember that our in our uh, um, somehow uh, yeah proof or, or in our uh, description of the error out of sample or of the bias bias the bias variance decomposition, we have used the fact that our uh, p of data of x, y is equal to p of x, g of y given x, but we've said that g of y given x is equal to a delta function of y minus p of x. And t was the target function. Now, in the teacher-student framework, one the idea that, the, or at least in the version that I'm telling you, is that p of x is a neural network. So, you can fix the complexity of your near of your teacher by fixing the shape of your neural network. So, if p of x is my function and my function neural network, I can fix the complexity of my function by fixing the hyperparameters. And what you can try to tackle to understand is the pro is this problem. How is the exploration of my function space impacted by the complexity of this T of X? And there are several results on that, especially for shallow T of X, you can actually do some analytical calculation on how your Student network, which is the function f and n, so your student network, which has a different topology, maybe, is impacted by the teacher structure. So these theoretical frameworks helps you understand how the student network, which is what we have called basically the function we want to regress, so our f and n of x theta is impacted by the complexity of t of x. And the measure of your complexity is the topology of the teacher. Using this technique here, what you get is that at the end, the shape of your student will be exact, more very, very correlated and very, very similar to the shape of your teacher. In the sense that if you start with a very, very large layer, what you can do by inspecting the lambdas is remove nodes and only left with a core and, and only have a core that is your teacher and this thing is something that is very difficult to do as maybe some of you will will will, will see in the sense that after your you have learned your uh, your uh, after the learning inspecting and understanding where the function is it's usually very tough and moreover the problem is that very often the function will be like represented all over the network so if you have a very wide network what you will have is that the information will be spread across the network and therefore in order to analyze the network you need to get the whole set of parameters and usually the set of parameters is huge so having a technique that compresses the network enables you to find the proper structure inside it is something that basically turns the problem into a huge sparse one to sorry from a huge sparse problem into a small and dense problem and then what you can do is analyze the function how can you, the the what, one thing that might be interesting is that actually parametri this is a part of my, of my research, and actually part of also my thesis, is that weighting the feature that you are extracting is something that is the same as weighting, so as describing your network in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And the weights are precisely the eigenvalues. So basically, if you have a network that is like that, This network here is, is a fit forward one, so bipartite graph. And what you can do is basically describe the action of this network 
in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Of what? So this is a network and has an adjacency matrix A. Actually, what you can prove is that you can describe the same network using an equivalent adjacency matrix, that it's diagonalizable, and that you can describe in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And if you do this, those lambdas are precisely the weights of the feature. So how much each feature is relevant. And so by expecting the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, what you can start try, try to understand it is the property of your network and forcing somehow the learning in a regime where you always extract the same features and the same. Uh, and, and, and so th this is also something that is very useful for theoretical purposes in calculations. But this is of my, 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 my research line now. <laughs> and I mean, it has been basically my research line for the last two, two years. So there are lots of things we, I can, uh, of course, uh, I, I could tell you about, but uh, uh, I think that this is an, uh, a thing, I mean, it, it, to, to you, I hope that it sounds like a way in which you can parameterize your network. And if you parameterize your network differently, the learning process, of course, is much different. And there are clever ways and not clever ways of parameterizing your network. And the way you parameterize it impacts your performance. And especially if you add L2 regularization. So take a message, be very aware of the problem that you want to tackle. So the learning process that you want to, uh, that you want to set up and parameterize your network, maybe using convolutions, using uh, this kind of spectral parameterization. So somehow using uh, as less as feature as possible, maybe using transformers, maybe maybe using recurrent networks. So the way you describe yeah, when, when whenever you you hear about deep learning, very often it's not the deep fit for a neural network, but there are different ways of describing the network. And those different ways of describing the network impacts a lot, a lot the learning process. And indeed, the convolutions, so the convolutional neural network, which are some network that you use for computer vision, are basically a, a reparameterization of the feedforward ones. And, and, and so the way you parameterize and the way you regularize has a very deep impact because with convolutional neural network, you can start doing very, very nice um, learning processes on visual images, which is something that you cannot do using deep neural networks, using fit for fully connected. So it's a whole word. I hope that the general picture has been quite, uh, I mean, satisfying. And of course, if you have questions and you want to contact me and write me for uh, more information regarding on something, I'm, I'm definitely available. So thank you very much again. And I hope that you enjoyed it as I did. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Thank you very much. So let, let's uh, thank Lorenzo. And uh, I'm sorry, my, my, 